And we'll now call this special workshop meeting of the Jacksonville City Council to order. You have a copy of the agenda for tonight's meeting, uh, and I would entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. And also the proposed uh, the uh, consent items. Where is there any? There is none. There is none. Mm -hmm. All any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed. All right. Mayor, members of council, good to be with you this evening. Before we begin to work on the budget, I don't think it would come as a surprise to any of you to know that you have an award-winning media team. Every week, they broadcast the various activities of the mayor and council, whether it's a workshop, a council meeting, or whether it's something having to do with, the, with one of the advisory boards. This past week, members of our media team attended the North Carolina City County Communicators Conference. There were 44 awards given out and 133 entries for the various categories. Very pleased to tell you that your media team received four of those awards. They received an award for the one-time special programming relative to the Monford Point Marine Memorial dedication. They received an award for the printed publication for to the 2017 calendar, the judges remarked on the unusual use of postcards to tell the story of the history of the city. They won an award for a special item, which was the Hero Mile, and it was used at the Marine Corps Half Marathon and the Remembrance Run. And the fourth award they won was for special citizen engagement, and that was the use of Facebook to broadcast the city council meetings. So if you would turn to the monitors, you're going to see four of our personnel in the media room. They're supposed to turn on their camera, and we can all wave to them. <laughs> there they are. <laughs> As you can tell, ESPN has nothing on the city of Jackson. Very, pr very proud of that. Very proud. Also, as you go out this evening, if you will look in the uh, entrance to the media team's offices, the four uh, awards are displayed in the window. And again, congratulations, a job very well done. Last week, we began the discussion of the budget. There were four budget notes. Uh, two were primarily format. One budget note had to do with the question Please review the legal status relative to the length of time a bond may be repaid. City attorney and the finance director worked on the response. I'll be happy to read it for them. The North Carolina statute state that bonds can be issued for a period that reflects the life of the improvements. Refinance bonds cannot be for a period greater than 40 years. The LGC shall, by regulation, establish the maximum period of usefulness of the capital projects for which the local government may issue bonds, but no capital project may be assigned a period of usefulness in excess of 40 years. The bonds which we were discussing last week would be for a 20-year period. I believe that addresses uh, that question. The second follow-up had to do with the Parkwood sewer project. And what we'd like to do is ask Greg Michaud, the city engineer, North Carolina State graduate extraordinaire, to walk you through an overview of the regional pump station and western trunk sewer. So, Greg, if you would. Yes, sir. Good evening. Uh, and you were promised an update last time. And to do that, what I'm going to do is give you a, a really very brief history of the project you know what are the roots of this project and then I'm going to review the scope of the project with you and then after that we'll go through the project schedule and our cost estimate for the project and the roots of the project start back in 2009 with what we called the uh, Sewer Service Area Master Plan. This was adopted by Council during 2009. And this plan looked at where the city could expand. It, 
it looked out 25 years and tried to decide, you know, where was the city going to grow to and what would the sewer uh, demand for those areas look like. And then once it did that type of projection, it laid out a backbone for a wastewater collection system to intercept sewer from those developing areas. And the plan foresaw the primary growth area radiating outward from and north of uh, Western Boulevard between Gum Branch Road and Newburn Highway. And to accommodate this sewer, it proposed something a little bit different than what we had done in the past. It proposed, for lack of a better word, a beltway around the existing sewer that's in the core of the city. And that beltway is represented by that red line that starts uh, over near Piney Green Road, sort of hooks around Western Boulevard, comes on to Gum Branch, and the arrow ends in Williamsburg Plantation, where it envisioned, actually back then, it envisioned Williamsburg Plantation, Parkwood area, hence the name Parkwood Regional Pump Station, which is now in the Williamsburg uh, area. And what it did was it uh, then envisioned that pump station pumping through a new force main out to the land treatment system, which you see there in the green. So that's the brief history. And this is, voila, the project. Um, what you see there is the project superimposed on an aerial. As you can see, the city is to the right-hand side, and the green line is, uh, is adjacent to Western Boulevard. And on the left-hand side of the slide, you see those green lagoons, which is the LTS. And so the project, I'll tell you about what the project entails. First, it entails a 36 and 42-inch trunk sewer that goes from Western Boulevard, where Williamsburg uh, Parkway intersects Western Boulevard, down Williamsburg Parkway, across Gum Branch, down to the end of Williamsburg Parkway in Williamsburg Plantation, where it takes a left and it uh, moves towards Royal Creek and basically follows an existing sewer corridor we have right there now. And there it is on on a little bit snazzier uh, map. And so, again, it's going to discharge to a pump station. So part of the project involves building a pump station. This pump station, when it first starts up, is going to pump about 7,500 gallons per minute. We're able, we'll be able to upgrade it to about 10,500 gallons per minute by at some future date simply dropping in a third pump. And then it is set up for the long range where we basically mirror that pump station on the site with another one just like it and we can go to 22.7 MGD. And this force main is going to pump through almost five miles, that's Clemson math, 4.8 miles, NC State math, <laughs> <laughs> through a, a 36 inch force main out to the LTS except at the New River where it's going to, of course, uh, like our existing force main, divide and go into uh, two 24 inch lines so that we have some redundancy there at the hard to get to part of the project. Then at the uh, LTS, of course, we have to get it into our treatment system. So what we're doing at the LTS is we are um, constructing a rather beefy splitter box, valve splitter box that this force main will dump into. And we're also redirecting our existing 36 inch force main into this splitter box. And we're also having to build a, uh, a platform out there as part of this project for a uh, conveyor that uh, basically conveys screenings from our uh, screens that you know get the trash out of the wastewater before it goes into the lagoons. We're having to build a platform for that uh, conveyor and that conveyor dumps it into dumpsters. Then uh, at the LTS we're also Having, we have a chemical feed system, and this chemical feed system feeds hydrogen peroxide into our existing 36-inch force main, and that's for odor control. Well, of course, we're going to want to feed um, 
hydrogen peroxide into the new force main, given the length of the force main. And so what we're going to end up doing is have to do some improvements out there. We're going to have to run a line, of course, from the, the system over to the new force main. We're going to have to add some new pumps, new controls. And while we're there, we're going to make some uh, health and safety improvements to that site that, that are needed. So moving back into town, what we're going to do is, again, part of the Beltway on Western Boulevard. We're going to construct phase one of that, and that's a 24-inch force main. And when we construct that, that means that we can redirect the Carolina Forest Pump Station uh, into that force main, and we can take some of the pressure off of the Henderson Basin that, you know, is pretty, pretty tight. It's, it's, it's near capacity. And so, quite naturally, we're going to have to uh, do some rework at the Carolina Forest pump station. And then, not part of this project, but it, in the CIP, there is uh, what's called the uh, Western, Boulev Western Trunk Sewer Phase 2. And that involves a, a, a new pump station, we think pretty close to Gateway North, the rest of the force main, and it's also going to involve some uh, gravity sewer so that we can collect sewer in that area, send it to that pump station, and send it on around this beltway. So during the last workshop, Dr. Woodruff let you know that we were going to do this project in, in through five separate contracts, and he gave you some of the reasoning as to why we were going to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the limits of those projects. And then we're going to talk about the timing of that in just a moment. But contract one is what we call force main segment two. That runs from uh, Richlands Highway, uh, the um, LTS side of Richlands Highway, out to the LTS. Force main segment one runs from basically the undeveloped, where the pump station is, the undeveloped portion of Williamsburg uh, Plantation uh, through Burton, across the river, through Burton Park, and underneath uh, Richlands Highway. Then contract three is what I call sort of the, the mechanical project. That's going to involve the, the headworks additions, the, the hydrogen peroxide system improvements, and the pump station. Contract four is the gravity sewer, again from Western Boulevard to the undeveloped portion of Williamsburg Plantation. And then contract five is the Carolina Force uh, pump station upgrades and the Western Boulevard Force Main, uh, the, the phase one of that. And so this is our opinion of cost. This opinion of cost was developed uh, when we hit 95% uh, design completion. So well, when we knew what essentially the nuts and bolts were going to look by, like, uh, everything, every estimate done prior to that was, you know, sort of uh, uh, looking at the big picture. And so as you can see, with contingency, we're projecting the project to run around $34 million. And those are broken down, of course, by contract. Is that Clemson numbers or state numbers? That's um, a, our, our, our estimate numbers. <laughs> Let me address that. If it comes in exactly like this, it was a Clemson number. If it comes in higher than this, it was an NC State number. Yes. <laughs> Yes, we always like, we engineers always like to say this is an estimate. We believe that this is a fairly conservative estimate, but of course we won't know until we, we get the bids. This and be, this be a state revolving fund bond here or what? No, sir. We'll, we'll address that in Alan just a Alan is going to talk about it in just a, in just a moment. Uh, so, where we are on the project is that we're... Contract one, contract two, and contract three is, are pretty much ready to bid. But we have one ease, set of easements that we have not yet obtained, and we're still negotiating over those. It's still take, it's taken us a little bit longer than we envisioned to get that, those particular set of easements. It are the easement, it's the easements on the undeveloped portion of Williamsburg Plantation. 
Believe it or not, we have all the easements along Pony Farm Road and through Burton Park. Uh, we, we acquired those in, I don't know, something like nine months. Um, and so what you see here is not a, a, a date-based um, uh, schedule, but it is, it's a time-based. And so the green represents the bidding phase and the blue represents the construction phase. And so our contract one, which is the force main, we, we intend to bid that first. Then we will follow that with contract two, which is the next force main. And then after that, we're gonna start <coughs> on the pump station. And what you'll see there is you'll see some things called intermediate substantial completion uh, notations, ISC. And what we want to, to what we want the force mains to essentially do are to be um, out of the way of the um, for contract two to be out of the way of the contractor who's building the pump station. So that's part of the reason, another reason for the lag. And there are, there are several different reasons uh, of, for the lags in the contracts. Um, you know, I can bore you with the details, but I'm not gonna, going to. Um, but with that said, you know, we've been working with finance, we've been talking to the LGC, and they really would like for us to try to, if we can, tighten this up a bit. So where we are right now is we, we believe we can pull contract three up by 30 days so that the lag time between the, 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 when we go to bid for contract one and when we go to bid for a contract three is, a, is roughly 105 days as opposed to 135 days. And we have some, and then you'll see we, we're talking about moving up contract five. We have some flexibility with contract five because when we make the upgrades to the pump station, we can still let the wastewater go to where it goes right now and not worry about the gravity sewer having to be in place. And so when the gravity sewer, which is contract four, is finished, then we can, at our leisure, for lack of a better description, direct the wastewater into the gravity sewer. So with that, I will let Alan. So the financing of this project uh, will be um, with a revenue bond. Uh, we'll be going to market to do the revenue bond. But um, to talk about how we have to go through that process, LGC has to approve any debt that the city incurs uh, if, other than our vehicle and equipment financing based on some certain criteria. Uh, one of those, if it's, if it's financed over five, more than five years, and this loan, as Dr. Woodruff previously mentioned, would be for 20 years. And then if the, uh, if the loan is for uh, more than $500,000 or one-tenth of 1% 1 of the assessed property value in this loan, it would be around $34 million in revenue bonds, would certainly meet that, that criteria. But the LGC will not give their approval until uh, bids representing about 75% of the project are in hand. And back on Greg's scenario there, that would be about 105 days after we have received the first bid. So we're looking at between three and four months when we would have the 75% in hand where we could go to market and market the revenue bonds at that time. <clears throat> For this process, we'll be using First Southwest, who is our financial analyst that handles that handled the refinancing for us last summer when we refinanced the bonds there. Uh, they will be coordinating our team, which uh, cons um, consists of our bond attorney. It's the same one that we used last year. Um, we will have to have two underwriters this year uh, based on the size of the revenue bond, and we'll, one of those will be the uh, underwriter that we use for our refinancing. And then uh, on the team will also be the underwriter's attorneys. But we've, as Greg mentioned, we've had preliminary conversations with the LGC discussing the scope of the project. And so we uh, are in, in the process of working on our feasibility study. The uh, uh, financial analyst has put out an RFP to get a consultant to do our feasibility study. Uh, we have signed the contract with Stantec 
And so they are working on that now. We've provided them with information to work on a new rate model. And uh, that feasibility study is required by the LGC based on the uh, uh, size of this revenue bond. So uh, later this month, we should be getting our first uh, look at the rate model. And at that time, we should, be have, we should have a better direction on how our rates may be affected by this revenue bond. So based on the, the process, we're looking at 105 days after the first bid when we can go to market. Um, we will, we will um, work through that process. It'll take about 30 days after we get the 75% of the bids. Uh, we'll go to market and it'll take about another month after the close of the sale for us to receive the funds from the sale of the revenue bond. So from the time we receive our first bid, we're looking at uh, a five to six month period that we'll have to upfront the cash to pay for these projects until we get the money in for the revenue bond. The 75% represents roughly 24 to 25 million dollars. Fortunately, we won't have to, uh, while, while Gail would say we have to front that money, and that's the reason why we will be using the fund balance from water and sewer. The reality is invoices will not come in during that time quick enough to actually consume your fund balance. If you remember from the presentation last week, your current fund balance in water and sewer is sufficient to cover that 75%. So what we will do, again, is have 75% of the bonds, those bids in hand, we will award those bids, obviously, through you. And then, as invoices come in, we'll be paying cash. Once the bonds are approved and issued, then the city will be refunded the cash that we have fronted. Now, gentlemen, any other points you want to add before we ask for questions? What questions would you like to have? Going back to 2009, which I guess is the genesis of this area of wide master plan. It's a stretch for me to recall back to that some details, but I'm thinking the change in the annexation laws had not yet occurred, right? And part of this project was based on the possibility of annexing some of these areas that would be served by this line. With the change in the annexation laws, <clears throat> Is it is anticipated there's still sufficient growth to merit the feasibility of this aside from the Henderson Drive pump station? Thank you, Justin. I can. I'd like to add one thing. Since when it was first presented, it was not totally towards. Well, I guess it was, of course, geared toward growth. But the option we had originally was we were going to either have to upsize all the way down mm -hmm. our existing infrastructure. So, Part of it, yeah. you know, well, to, to handle the additional capacity, or to create additional capacity, so we, instead of deciding yeah. to upgrade 12 or 15 pump stations within the system, this was an option to expand your uh, capacity as well as avoid those costs. So, Plus, well, you know, you had redundant, redundancy in case something happened to the That receptor. was the main. That well, I think the main thing was if they said, you know, if you're going to grow, you're going to have to start upgrading each step down the line, okay. or you could build this yeah, in we, another direction. We actually had a, a master plan that preceded this that had multiple uh, upsizing, upgrading projects of our existing infrastructure that involved upgrading several trunk sewers, upgrading several pump stations, uh, a, a, a lot of difficult work uh, in areas that are, were already developed. And recall, what I said earlier was the SSAMP, the, the mas this master plan, proposed something different. Instead of funneling everything through our existing infrastructure, it created a beltway around it such that we were going to take the pressure off of that infrastructure. The first step in that, of course, is we're going to redirect Carolina Force a pump station out of the Henderson Basin. And then we're going to set ourselves up for other development that occur occurs along Western Boulevard. To the question of annexation, there was, I cannot remember the neighborhood, but we looked at annexation up uh, Gum, Gum Branch um, 
and we ultimately decided against that. This plan, the, the, really the only uh, forced annexation that I recall it looked at was that area. And what it envisioned was, was actually, um, if I remember correctly, and I'm going to go back and look at this, it was to um, um, upgrade the, we looked at upgrading the existing uh, wastewater system that was part of that neighborhood and then also taking, I think, a side stream of wastewater and pumping it into the force main but not routing it through, you know, this, this new pump station. Also, I remind you, the area uh, that is undeveloped in Williamsburg is already in the city. Also, the area that is on the what I'll call the north side of Western Boulevard that has gone by several different names. D.R. Horton is the latest owner of that. You remember several years ago they submitted a development plan. For those, for the rest of Williamsburg to be developed and for that subdivision or that land to eventually be developed in the subdivision, we do need more capacity. We're currently in discussions with several property owners, Mr. Tootin being one, for property that's on Ramsey Road. So voluntary annexation is going to add some volume. The other thing is as we grow out 17 towards, towards Newburn, we're going to need capacity there. So the more we can relieve the current system and redirect things as Greg has described, it will give us the ability. There is also no question, though, that from the time that this process or study initially was initiated, the annexation laws have definitely changed. And it was originally $20 million when they said it first, so it hasn't quite doubled yet, <laughs> which I'm glad. Okay, so hopefully you're getting in on it. Yes, we have. Thank you. Any other questions on this? I'll do. Please. So, what do you think the probabilities are that the rate study is going to force an increase? We all sit back. <laughs> <and> <laughs> we're, we're sitting back. <laughs> that, it's a large revenue <coughs> bond that we'll be bringing on. Um, so, I mean, I can't say one way or the other. I, I, I would be remiss to say that. But, you know, we'll, we're, look, we're meeting with them, our first meeting, on April the 20th. And hopefully we'll have some ideas then. You know, we're providing them with information. You know, I had a, I had a uh, uh, com uh, conference call with them today. Uh, they had questions on some CIP projects and how they needed to be using fund balance. So we're getting information to them, but uh, I would not dare offer something um, as well, far as for odds. I didn't say you had to defend it. Because <laughs> I think, too, like Jerry, it makes me apprehensive to see us step out this far. And if you're looking for growth, Raising your rates is not the way to get it. I mean, that's not it. You know, you can't charge more and expect to, to, to grow more. I mean, we need to hold the line on our rates because we're high. And if we got to, you know, if we got to, if they tell us we have to raise rates a bunch, you're, you're working against yourself. Basically. And we would agree with that. One thing, uh, obviously, Gail is not with us this night. We do, we do appreciate the fact that Alan is with us. Uh, in previous conversations, Gail has said it's too early to know, but the good news is we do have some water and sewer debt that is coming off, that is being paid. And what we will do is follow up and let you know how much debt that is and what that frees up. What about the state revolving loan funds? Is that still a possibility? Is it still funded? Actually, I don't know the answer to that, and we will find out that for you. So. One thing that did interest me is that the, in, in issuing a bond, you have to have what they call a, a debt ratio. What that normally means is you look at your expenditures and your revenues. We are at a 1.0, which is really unusual, to be quite frank with you. In Florida, most of the projects we were involved with, uh, you had to have anywhere from a 1.25 to a 1.4. What that meant was you had to have 25% more revenue than your expenses were going to be. We've asked, uh, I've asked the, uh, the, our financial analysts why we are so low. And they said it's primarily because you're a military community. 
that while the base is not a customer, it is such a stable environment that you live in. The other point that uh, they made was that from the analysis which uh, Gail and, and Alan have provided to them, we don't spend 100% of our water and sewer budget every year. I believe it's more in the... Around 90%, I believe that's yeah. what we've come up with. So if you think of it, and again, this will be Clemson math, you, you'll figure out the exact. We are probably at, you know, like a 1.11 ratio right now because we're only spending about 90% of our budget. If we get to the place where we're spending 100% of our budget, that could put us into, into a difficult position where your debt ratio would have to be higher than 1.0. So right now, it's too early to know, but we'll follow up on state revolving loan fund information and also debt service that's coming that off. That affects your bond rating too, yes. doesn't it? That Right. Yes, sir. But uh, Mr. Bittner asked the other day, uh, you know, how do people get a AAA rating? It's simple. They buy insurance. Uh, we see no reason at all in, in the interest rate market that we're in. We see no, in, no benefit to pay the money to buy bond insurance that will shoot your rating up from an A to a AAA. It just... No it just isn't there. The yeah. no. No. I have a question, Dr. Woodruff. With the size of this project um, going out for bid, do you foresee that one company would be the winner of this particular project, or would there be multiple winners? I think there are going to be multiple winners, and that's the reason why we've broken the project into so many phases. As Greg has shown you, uh, one of the major phases is the lift station. Another phase, though, is five miles of force main that's only, what, six feet deep? Mm -hmm. well, six, six there are all kinds of contractors around who can put in five miles or, I'm sorry, 4.8 miles of force main that's six to eight feet deep. So we, we intentionally divided it up into contract portions and believe that you will get better prices by doing that. So those numbers will come back to us before we actually approve those phases. That's yes. correct. <clears throat> Any other questions on this? No. Gentlemen, thank you very much. You. Well done. If you'll recall, in a previous workshop, we asked you how you would like the budget presented this year. I know that each of you has had the opportunity to look on your iPad at the budgets. Uh, we will go through these in a little different format than we have in the past, but at any time as we go through the departments, uh, we would welcome the opportunity to have you ask additional questions. What I'd like to do... You know, we're going to, this evening, look at the budget focus on Parkwood, which we've now done. We're going to begin departmental reviews. And at the end of the evening, we'd like to talk to you about two of our budget focus topics, and that's the future of community development block grants and then the use of temporary agencies for part-time employees by the city. In the department reviews, if you'd like to follow along on the book, it's page 21. But the mayor and council's budget, as you will notice, from FY17 amended down to the proposed FY18, is actually reduced by about $7,000. And it will actually be reduced a little bit more. Why is that? There are two agencies or memberships that you've had in the past that you have decided you will no longer have membership in. For example, the Metro mayors, we have notified them in writing that we will not be participating there and then also the 17 corridor group. Between those two, that will be about a $15,000 savings. This only shows one of those, and that's the Metro Mayors. Any other questions on your budget? On the elections, uh, Carmen's with us. Carmen's with us, there she is. Um, as you know, last year we had no election. This year you will have election. 
Much to our surprise, when Carmen contacted the election office, she was told that they would like to have two early voting areas, not one. And we're still negotiating that. Carmen, do you want to make some comments regarding that, please? No, I think you covered it. Okay. Uh, we're, <laughs> we're, we're just waiting on the uh, Board of Elections to um, wait and see if there's any controversial elections or, you know, what's, what's going on at the time uh, the elections are about to occur before they decide. If we do have to have two early voting stations, uh, they will be at the Commons and at the Elections Office, or do you know? Uh, she's not sure. She was actually talking about the conference center across the street, but she hasn't, they haven't made up their mind. Okay. But we have budgeted this assuming that you're going to have to have two early voting stations. Now, that's determined by the Board of Elections, not by the city. But you can see we have uh, increased it from 25000 to $65,000 for that purpose. Legal budget, as you can see, it went up just a little, and that's because of the allocation formula for software and hardware. And then the city manager's budget actually went down, and that was because of the retirement of a long-term employee. Any questions on any of those four? Okay. Passports. I'm very pleased to tell you that the passport operation will bring in over $100,000 this year, whereas we had initially estimated it at $50,000. Uh, because of that, we have uh, certain postage and so forth expenses that will also go up. But you can see uh, projected revenue in the budget is still only $75,000, even though we probably will hit $100,000 again. And you can see that the expenses for that will be $10,300. So that's a very positive and extremely beneficial uh, program that the city continues to offer. On transportation planning, if you're following along in your iPad, that's page 41. You'll notice that the transportation planning uh, over the years has moved around significantly. Uh, part of this has to do with the long-range plan. The increase from 440 up to 459,000 is primarily due to the fact that uh, the MPO needs to update their long-range plan. So they'll be hiring a consultant to do that. There are also increases in uh, salaries and some IT charges. Any questions on transportation planning? Traffic control, significant increase from 16 to 17, and again 17 to 18. And that is because, if you'll remember, when the intelligent transportation system was installed to manage all your traffic signals, uh, we were under the impression that the funds were going to be fully supplied by the DOT, found out they were not. So for a four-payment program, we will be contributing about a half a million dollars each year. And this budget will be the second payment, and so we'll have two more payments, and they should continue with this budget number being somewhere for 19 and 20 in the $1.5 million area. Questions on that one? What is the line item for Powell Bill funding on that, <clears throat> 541? It says Powell Bill funding. That that goes into the traffic budget? That's the funding we're using to pay for that debt. We, we use, we, our initial payment was a combination of some general funds. Okay, they're just calling it Powell Bill funding. Okay. Well, it's coming well, out actually, of that yeah. Powell Bill allocation. Yeah. If you, it's out of our, our retained okay. Powell Bill funds. Okay. It's an eligible expense of the Powell Bill since it has directly to do with traffic. Okay. Thank you. How what was the total on that? I'm sorry? The total. Oh, the project cost? Underestimation on that. $2.2 million. $2 was, the, was the underestimate. That's what we have to pay. Heck, well, the, the, the project agreement said that the state would pay $5 million and the city would pay up to $2 million, or the additional above that. We thought the project was going to total 
five million dollars will it turn out by the time they add all the charges that DOT puts into the project you know it the total bill came out to be seven point two million dollars and so under the agreement they kicked in their five we had to put in the rest of it what would, it, what would that leave us as far as what we owe them? it will you will have two payments left mm -hmm. And I believe each of those payments is a half million dollars generally. Do you know exactly? Yes, we, Mayor and Council, we made one payment last year for about $1.1 million. The next payment will occur in FY18 for approximately half a million dollars. And then the final payment will occur in FY19 for approximately half a million dollars. And then it'll be all said and done. Okay, so instead of four payments, we're making three. Yes, sir, because we did make one $1.1 million balloon payment to start. And that was a combination of different revenue sources, including general fund and Pal bill. Thank you. On transit, you'll notice a significant change from uh, the actual 16 to the amended 17. That was primarily due to park and ride program. And you'll notice it dropped back down in 18 because obviously the park and ride only has to be funded one time. Now that project, while it's not underway, should commence sometime uh, later this summer or early fall. And that's to build that very large parking lot uh, up at the commons that will assist there. Let me see if there's any other note on transit. Any other questions on transit? Thank you, Anthony. Yes, sir. On community programs, you will notice that community programs have decreased. This is the result of some of the programs that were under community programs being transferred to the Office of Livable Neighborhoods when we set that up. So when we get to that budget, you'll notice a significant increase. Also, part of the transfer included the Youth Council activities, the Harmony program, and items associated with community program coordinator. So that's why this has gone down. Otherwise, uh, their budget has stayed, you know, pretty, pretty flat. Any questions on community programs? On page 57 of your book, if you look at the tourism, the projected revenues for this year under occupancy tax are about $850,000. Now, while the mayor and council uh, do not actually authorize expenditures, you are required to have this in your overall budget. So this is fully funded. Whatever their budget is, it has to be fully funded by occupancy tax. In this, they are proposing um, you know, the tourist related expenses and we have to stay with the formula of one third for capital and two thirds for promotional type things. Uh, overall, you can see the uh, budget is about $850,000 proposed. Any questions on the TDA? Whoops, I apologize. I'm so used to turning the page. What's the improvement project? Refresh my memory. The Tourism Development Authority, over time, those are various improvements that they have uh, contributed to. For example, they paid part of the Museum of the Marine, they paid for the... Oh, it's just past history? Uh, yes, sir. It's just, it shows the total amount okay. that they have done for projects. On human resources, you will notice the amended budget was 754,000. The proposed budget is 786,000. I am recommending that we add an additional employee to the HR department for the following reasons. As you'll see later in the program, we spend a significant amount of money through the temporary agencies. Some of those positions, I think we should actually bring in house. Part of this increase 
for that salary would be covered by the money that we are currently paying, the 35 percent surcharge that we're currently paying to the temp agencies. Also, the city council has, I believe very correctly, asked us to do a better job of recruiting diversity with police and fire and throughout the city. And in order to do that, we really need someone who is going to focus on that along with other things. So the additional employee that we're recommending is to expand our recruiting efforts and to take on some of the load for employees for the Recreation Department. Also, there, the wellness program in FY17 was $40,000. That is in this budget. I will also tell you that that is currently under review as to whether we will continue to fund the wellness program at that level. Uh, in, one of our base, in one of our budget focused topics about two meetings away, we will be discussing in depth where your health insurance program is. And currently that 40000 is budgeted. We may come back with some recommendations to reduce that. Is there any way to measure the effectiveness of that? Yes. It's been very difficult. It's been very difficult. Uh, as you will hear in a couple of weeks, you know, we can put out wellness programs and we can say this many people took part in a weight loss program and this many people have, you know, done cigarette cessation. Where our real difficulty is, is the federal HIPAA laws that prevent us from actually knowing which employees are doing what from a health insurance standpoint or from a wellness standpoint. We have general numbers, but what I can tell you from what we've seen so far, the cost drivers for health insurance are obesity, hypertension, diabetes. And the program up to this point has really not been able to address that. And that's why as we once again, uh, talk to you in a couple of weeks. We'll have more information and we'll decide do we keep focusing this way or do we do something, something different. do something differently? How are you currently collecting your information from your employees? Kimberly, please. As she comes up, generally the answer is the information is through either surveys that we can ask there are certain questions we can ask of employees. So if we do surveys and ask them what programs would they like, then we can get that directly back from the employee. On the other hand, anything that actually has to do with what they are actually doing in their health program, we can't ask. Absolutely. But the Blue Cross Blue Shield people can. So pick it up from here, please. Right. So when we decided to focus on the wellness initiative and utilize someone from Blue Cross Blue Shield, it was because they had access to that information and could target those individuals for disease or case management. Um, our hope is that this year we can expand that focus um, but minimize our expense for the program. Um, we do need to engage with Blue Cross Blue Shield in order to have access to that data. Um, I think the question was how do we get that information? We, uh, we, do, uh, we engage our employees monthly through newsletters and emails and we've recognized that's not working so now it's going to be face to face in departments. We do it, did a survey to start the program to say what would you be most interested in so that we knew where to focus. Then we took the data over this last year to say has there been any movement based on what we've done? How much engagement has there been? Um, the good news is that Blue Cross Blue Shield can actually communicate with the physicians where we cannot. Uh, so at this point, I think to Dr. Woodruff's um, comments, we are, you know, we, we would like to see better movement. I think everybody across America would like to see better movement in the wellness programs. We're having the same problems everybody else is. Um, I think it's interesting, too, that uh, we have 972 covered lives. We have 517 of those are employees. So it's also very hard to reach spouses and dependents, which I'm sure many of you that are in, in business understand that as well. So um, I think, although we don't have all the answers, we have a few, and we definitely know where our trend is. I'd like to see us continue fo to continue focusing on the case management and the disease management, which is really where we're going to hopefully have an impact. 
But, Angel, were you asking about the individual health information to provide that wellness program, or is that only to Blue Cross Blue Shield? I, I they only it, have that info, no, right? The, just the yes. ones that the, um, pay, that the personnel themselves would self-select to indulge. Okay. And I was then I, I was about to ask you, with your surveys and your emails, with your best estimate, what would you say in terms of the surveys that the um, employees are responding? Is it like a good 20%, 30%, less than 15 Because oh, yeah. I know that sometimes surveys, you know, yeah. sometimes people will and sometimes people will not, but at least are you getting a good amount of participations from the employee that can help at least to give you a glimpse of a true accurate data? So, um, yes. I would say we're getting probably approximately 20% engagement, um, and that's actually engagement in the program and to include um, the evaluations or surveys. Uh, we'd like to see it higher than that. And one of our, you know, again, one of our challenges is while we may have an opinion as to, you know, who has diabetes or, you know, uh, hypertension or obesity we are prohibited from actually, you know, calling out specific people, you know, and we don't want to do that. We've been very successful in getting out to the employees and talking to them about the new Phonadoc program. And we've had now over 89 people in March, I mean, January, February, March, we had over 89 people use that as a savings of over $50,000. But that's not going to balance our books. I mean, you're going to hear when we get to health, we have a $500,000 issue that we're facing in health insurance. And of that, roughly three hundred and fifty to 375000 is going to come from the general fund or from water and sewer or stormwater. It's going to come from the city. And the other one hundred and twenty to 150000 is going to have to come from the employee through rate increases. We really, uh, as a nation, no one has figured out yet how to uh, address those three things. And we are, believe me, we are uh, open to any and all suggestions. I will tell you that our smoking cessation program has been a success where we have gone to the employees, not to individual employees, but we've gone to employees and we have said, by the way, in case you didn't know, we have this program. And if you do the following things, here's the reward that you can get. And after the last presentation about two weeks ago, the very next morning, I had an employee walk into my office and said, I'll take you up on the challenge. I'm going to quit smoking cigarettes. Well, we can give challenges and we can give initiatives, but we can't give any pressure. And, and we have stayed away. Some have not, but we have purposely stayed away from having different rates for different things. Because if you're not careful, you'll have someone say, well, you give me a different rate because I'm a smoker, but you're not giving this person a different rate because they're obese, or you're not giving this person a different rate because they have diabetes. So we really have, have tried to stay away from different rates based upon those reasons. We will get you, though, uh, some information that will show you what the employees are saying to us they're interested in. The thing that is baffling, though, is they say they're interested in it, and then when Blue Cross tries to offer it, they're not signing up for it. And that's the frustrating thing. Is it a frustrating thing, or do they feel like it's a catch-22? It, it could be that. It's frustrating to us, mm -hmm. but from the employee standpoint, I know one of the things is many employees, when they get a call at night at home, or their wife gets or spouse gets a call at night at home and you see Blue Cross Blue Shield come up on your, your dial, you figure it's a marketing call, so you don't answer it. You know, when in fact it's someone with our wellness program following up. So it's, um, again, we will have to make a decision, but the full 40000 is in your budget. It may not stay. Anything else? The city clerk. Nominal changes. It actually went down a couple of thousand. Uh, 
in your budget book on page 67, it talks about seasonal employees. That's actually a misnomer. It's non-benefited employees because you'll remember that uh, I believe a year ago you put in the budget some money so that we could spend more time and focus on our records management system. And that is working well. The young lady who is hired is not seasonal, but she is hired to work 20 hours a week. Mm -hmm. And so she's year round, but she's non-benefited. Because you'll recall, in order to get benefits, you have to work 60 hours in a two week pay period to become a benefited employee. In the finance department, their budget went down. I refresh your memory that last year they had $100,000 for capital outlay, and that was because of the software packages that they needed to buy that would actually help produce this report better and also help produce the CAFR. Uh, Alan, do you want to address that? Any questions on that? It's working well. It's been implemented. Also, you'll recall that uh, last year we had a fee increase relative to credit cards, and that's reflected in this year's budget also. In the metering area, uh, old habits are hard to break. In the metering area, we've actually had a reduction in their proposed budget. Part of that was that when we looked at the allocation formula for the media, I'm sorry, for the IT services, uh, they did not have as many service needs as others. And then we had some capital outlay items that were purchased last year that are not purchased again this year. Of course, metering is 100% funded by the Water and Sewer Fund. Fleet maintenance. Sorry about that. On fleet maintenance, their budget has gone up. It uh, went up about $200,000, $240,000. Two reasons. Number one is that we have had uh, about an 8.9% increase in purchases of repairs and parts the cost have gone up you'll also see that there uh, is a nominal increase in salaries due to uh, the promotion of three mechanics as they get more skills we give them automatic promotions and you will also see in the budget book on page 79 that ed is requesting a non-benefited seasonal employee to help with all the mowers we, Richard, I got a question for you. If you go back to some moment, you talked about the increase in the 8.9 percent, but is that split out because under line item three, it's utilities, maintenance, professional services, ITS, and video media charges. So was that the shift in allocation in that category? That's where the 8.9 percent increase is. Yes, but uh, you actually had a decrease in mm -hmm. in supplies. Well. Ed is here. The, the information I have says line three is increased by 8.9 due in part to an increase in the purchase of repairs, repair parts for all city vehicles and equipment, and in part to an increase to the chargeback fuel maintenance account, which is all fuel and maintenance charges for the city. You want to explain that increase? Please? Yes, sir. Um, over the time, whenever we sense about the when we outsource repairs, their labor charges have gone up. Parts have, have continued to go up. Right, but my question was, under line item three, supplies would be under line item two. I guess that's probably an accounting question. Well, actually, or, no, or do I you guess put it under line item we, three under maintenance? Maintenance and professional services. Yes, sir. The supplies are the supplies that belong to fleet, our normal everyday supplies that we buy, shop supplies that we take care of fleet. The the part that went up is actually what we what we pay to repair vehicles. That's not considered supplies. Right. That's considered repairs or maintenance or outsourcing or even the fuel. And that's uh, under the maintenance category. That's under the maintenance. The supplies okay. are when we buy 
cleaning supplies or whatever for the for the shop oh, itself. Oh, okay. Not actual supplies for yeah. your repairs. Exactly, and... sir. Okay. Now the general fund fund balance, non-departmental rather. Uh, you will notice that this has gone up by about $140,000. Part of that is actually a combination of debt service that has come off. Debt service dropped from 656000 the current budget, to 440000 But you'll also see that there are two very large projects that TDA is going to be funding. One is the $350,000 gateway sign, and the other is a $100,000 Beirut Memorial. Now, those will be funded by TDA, so in the revenue account, there is a transfer that puts that money into the general fund. Overall, though, that, that budget stayed, you know, almost flat if you take those two things out, and then, of course, backed out the debt service. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. I have a question right quick. Um, just briefly, going back under the city clerk's department uh, with fleet maintenance where we have our seasonal employees, is there ever a point in time that you and the department heads can um, ever make adjustments that these individuals will no longer be seasonal employees, that you may actually move them into full-time employees because there might be a necessary need of the city to have these individuals as full-time versus seasonal? Does that ever occur? Actually, uh, it does occur, and in a few minutes when we talk about the temporary employees, you're going to see some recommendations there because when you, you know, for example, Ed is asking for a seasonal employee. And after 12 weeks or 16 weeks, whatever the mowing season is, that person will go away. On the other hand, there are other areas, such as in our before and after school program, where those programs started off small and we were using seasonal employees and we kept adding more hours and kept adding more hours and kept adding more hours. There comes a point where you have to ask the question, is it fair to have someone basically working 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, and call them a seasonal employee. Aren't those people really city employees? And shouldn't they be moved accordingly? If you remember either a year or two years ago, was it two years ago, we brought that same topic to you in Michael's area. And you all agreed, I believe it was five employees, Michael, that five employees who were working 52 weeks a year really should become city employees. So the answer to your question is absolutely. Many of our seasonal employees are just seasonal. On the other hand, well, some of them... whether or not the manager has the authority to do it on his own or the, through the budget process? Oh, no, I was just wondering if these individuals was just transition over to become city employees. The only way that can occur is with council's concurrence. And we will be discussing some of those uh, this evening and in future budgets. One thing on non-departmental that I would like to mention, and you're going to see a, a budget topic discussion on this next week. Current payments for the 800 megahertz radio system, they're in this budget. We currently are paying interest only on our portion of the system. The principal repayments will begin next year, FY19, next budget, two budgets away. The next three payments after, so let me finish, in 19, the amount will be $28,500. Okay, that's the good news. After that, the next three payments will be $642,000 each and a final payment of $316,500. So as we're looking several budgets away, those are going to be major impacts that we're going to have to plan for. Where are you showing that? That's on page uh, 84, and it's budget note number three under, under general fund non-departmental. 
And who are we paying that to? The county? Paying that to Allen? The county? And who in turn, they're the ones who issued the bonds for it. They fronted, they fronted the cost, right? We're paying that back. They borrowed the money. Yes, sir. Yeah, they fronted the money. Yes, sir. And so that's not in public safety. Why? Well, actually, I don't know the answer to that. And Gail's not here. So, Alan, do you know why it's not in public safety? We'll be happy to get you the answer on that one. Mike, you can come up, please. On page 86 and 87, you get into the public safety for police. Uh, you will notice that the police department budget is up about $400,000. It's primarily due to two things. When we looked at the IT allocation formula this past year, we said, okay, not everybody's using as much, and some people are using a whole lot more. Well, it's not a surprise to you that the police department's budget for IT allocation went up substantially. They have every computer, every, you know, they, have, they have computers everywhere. It's a computerized system. So their budget for IT charges went up substantially. One other thing that went up $100,000 is the separation allowance. If you look at budget note on page 88, budget note 6 says the following. The city funds the separation allowance to sworn law enforcement officers in accordance with general statutes 143-166.42. Officers who retire with 30 or more years of credible service or have attained 55 years of age and completed five or more years of credible and continuous service receive 0.85% of their annual base rate of compensation for each year of credible service. This applies until they reach age, age 62. Through retirements this year, the city's obligation for the separation allowance went up $100,000. Now, this is like a tunnel, if you think of a tunnel. There are people who are in the system who will eventually come out of the system. Hopefully, you have people going in and coming out every year, but that's really not what happens. Some years, you may have three or four people go in, and nobody come out. Other years, you may have three or four people come out and nobody go in. So this is one of those years when the separation allowance has to go up $100,000. But that will float. Right now, there's 16 people who are in that separation allowance. We have no more police officers. Um, was it my first year of his own council? I think we there was like a grant that funded like five police officers. We have gone beyond that where we're totally um, paying the expense for those officers, correct? The, the COPS grants which you received have all been expended and you're now 100% funding those employees. You want to add anything to that? Uh -huh. The only thing you've got is your crisis counselor. Yes, that's the only, and that's that grant's been renewed for another two years. And the separation allowance is paid by, or is, it's done by an actuarial study anyhow, so there's really nothing we can do about it. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Now, while we are talking about police personnel, the, we received 911 funding from the board. There has been a change in the policy, and Mike has been asking for some time to have additional people who are telecommunicators. This year, through the budgeting process, I have authorized the transfer, and I'm asking you to support the transfer from another department funded by the general fund where that employee was not needed due to downsizing of workload. I have assigned that person to become an extra telecommunicator. That will hold down overtime. 
in the last week, Mike had conversations with the 911 board about them funding an additional telecommunicator. So can you talk to us about that? Yeah, they, they've changed their stance on funding 911 telecommunicators, but they'll only fund them for peak times. So um, what, what we're able to do is we're, they're able to fund a telecommunicator, and that telecommunicator will be during peak times, which it looks like, uh, which is not any surprise, uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights. And it will be probably from around 3 o'clock till uh, 3 a.m. Now that will be a say, the 911 board. The 911 board. We receive 911 funds, so they've changed. The 911 board has voted to uh, authorize us to hire only telecommunicators that that will uh, hit the peak times. So we're able to hire a person and put them on. You know where we have three telecommunicators on right now. During peak times, we'll be able to add a, a fourth telecommunicator to answer those calls. Now, let me clarify. This is not a grant. It does not require a match. This is what they're basically saying is statewide, anybody who gets 911 funds, you can use a portion of your funds. This is not extra funds. This is of the funds that you're getting from the 911 board, you can now you're authorized to use some of that money to pay one or more, depending, and you have a formula. In our case, we only qualified for one. If the uh, city grows and the number of calls grow, we could possibly qualify for two. The other part, though, is this. The money cannot be used to replace an existing telecommunicator. Only to add. Only, Only to add. add. But again, this is not like the COPS program where after three years we had to pick up the money. Right. It's continuous. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, we all know that, you know, uh, what the government gives, the government can take. So if for some reason the board two or three years from now changes their policy, we'll have to face that. Quick question. Refresh my memory. How do they decide how much money they kick back to you? Well, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting question. One of the things that they do is, is it's based upon your actual expenses. So um, what, what it, right now it is. So it, they look at our expenses in a five-year period, and then they average it out, and they give us that funding based upon that five-year average. The, the thing for us that I think is very helpful is that what we did is uh, we financed our our new tele, our new uh, 911 center uh, over a several year period, and that enabled our our a num the funds that we have to be at a certain rate. So, even though we're we're um, we're getting close to using most of the fund balance in that 911 fund, uh, we still have enough money to fund this uh, this telecommunicator position. But it's 60 cents on on every phone line, both the wired lines. The via the uh, the vo voice over IP lines and the wireless lines, and that goes into a pool, and the pool is based upon uh, what your actual expenses are. Now, I think what, what you might be thinking of, Mayor, is before that, that fund was based upon population and and service area. Well, they they discontinued that because the fund balances got so high. And then they also determine what's eligible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they kind of say you can't. They set the well, they've always, yeah. been, they've always been kind of strict on, on the use of the funds. But uh, like you say, when, when, we was under, when it was on population based, it, it was a lot more beneficial to us. And I might mention that half of those, the people on that board are vendors. And, of course, they're collecting the money, and then half of them are public safety people. Mm -hmm. And by vendors, what do you mean? I mean, like uh, AT&T and... Uh, and CenturyLink and Time Warner, anyone that's, that's providing those services. So, so if you can justify more expense, then you can be reimbursed. That's correct. So that's what we're, what we're sure. trying to do here. And in, in effect, actually get some more money through the 911 funds. Right. Because we're really impacting us. At first, my first thought was we were just playing a, didn't really matter, but it's, it, it does matter. It does yes, it, it's, standpoint. every phone that you have, for example, every cell phone that, uh, that is, is 60 cents. It's 60, 64 cents, I believe, is, is what the cost is. So every month we're paying 64 cents for 911 services. 
that money goes into a big pot and it's distributed based upon actual expenses. And uh, there's been there's been a lot of crew. expenses of the nine one one center. Okay. So now, how do you keep up with it? Does Gail keep a separate set of records for that? Yes. Or Alan does? It's it's, what is it? Yeah, we keep that in a, in a separate project. So we have okay. to keep up with the cost and the revenue coming in as in a so separate a project. Separate, uh, That's correct. And even, even we charge like the, uh, the GIS, some of the GIS fees. If, uh, if there's any work tickets from the 911, we charge those back for, for IT services. The phone lines that came in, the consoles, the is computer that a system. Collaboration between somebody in your department and accounting, or does accounting pick all that stuff up as a? Um, that's between us, ITS and uh, accounting. And, and accounting. Yeah, the, all, yeah, all three. See, in in the proposed budget, we've shown four hundred six thousand six hundred forty-two dollars coming out of the nine one one grant or the 911 right. project right. account. Do they still keep it divided where yeah. I know you have your your telecommunications divided as far as phone service and then you have your radio say like with your um, Yeah, actually some state legislation yeah, changed just, that. And the state legislation says anything in those four walls is eligible for reimbursement. So anything in our, in our four walls of our 911 center is subject to reimbursement. That's good. So the UPSs that we have in there, the, the radio si part of the radio system, because part of the radio system is located at the towers, but the stuff that's inside the 911 center is funded by that 911 fund. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Richard, we're going we're gonna to take a quick break and come back to this discussion. Could we do, could we do one thing? Could we cover fire? And then what I was going to recommend is that we stop the department reviews and then go to the, to the topics. Would that be acceptable? Fire. I appreciate that. And fire is actually a pretty easy one to cover. If you'll notice, their budget has gone down from uh, 8.2 million to 7. Point, roughly 7.7. .7. That's primarily due to a decrease in full-time salaries. It's also a decrease in utilization charges and a decrease in non-capital equipment. I will also say to you that with the retirement of Chief Reed and the, uh, the resignation of Chief Lee, uh, we have decided that we will not fill those two positions, but we are adding two firemen on the front line. That flattens our overall management. It keeps the number of budgeted positions the same, but it puts more people on what we commonly refer to as the tailboard. Thank you. That all you have? For the moment, and then we'll come back after the break. Thank you.
All right, we're back in session. Uh, thank you for allowing us to have the time on the department reviews. What we'd like to do is spend a little bit of time on two of the budget focus topics. The first, I'm very pleased to ask Lily to join us to talk about community development and the federal program and potential changes that will be coming to the federal budget. So, Lily, please. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. We'll start out, as you know, there are a lot of changes going on at the federal level regarding the federal budget, and we have seen over the years, and this uh, slide show here gives you an example of just how our funding has been declining over the last several years, uh, from a peak of about 640000 in 2008 to where we are today with approximately 343000 for FY18, there's a zero there because it is truly an unknown. We have not received our notice from HUD as of this year. We normally know by this time of year as we're working on the budget how much we're going to receive. That has not um, been released yet, so we don't know if we'll receive level funding or decreased funding. Just wanted to share a little bit of the President's 2018 message from the budget blueprint that's been released. Um, primarily what the priorities are going to be for the HUD portion of that budget is providing rental assistance to low-income households and eligible um, and help work eligible families receive self-sufficiency. In other words, that's the Section 8 voucher program will continue to be funded. It also states that there will be a greater role for state and local governments in the private sector to address community and economic development, need, economic development needs. So we can expect that um, we will be expected to do more without support of the federal government. It also states that what you're seeing now and hearing as relevant to the federal budget is just a sequential release of information. It's not the entire budget at this time. What we have at this point only talks about discretionary funding. It's not the detailed um, federal budget. They expect to release that later this spring. As what I've read is late May. It does state in this blueprint that there will, there will, will be an elimination of hundreds of programs or reductions in funding significantly that will be um, impacted. And it is the president's goal to redefine the proper role of the federal government. What we see in this blueprint is $40.7 billion in federal funding for HUD, and which is a $6.2 billion decrease, a 13% um, below prior year annual continuing resolution levels. Of that $40.7 billion, $35 billion of it is allocated for rental assistance programs. And there's some mo other money sprinkled throughout for things like lead-based paint removal, which is tied to help hopefully reducing health care costs so we can get lead out of the homes. But and of course, the big one here is the elimination <coughs> of the CDBG um, program and $3 billion loss for that. Other funding projections, what they're telling us again is that um, the 17 transportation hub budget, which is what we um, fall under, has been wrapped up and it's likely to move as one omnibus spending measure by the end of April. Um, the other bills have not been wrapped up and is expected that those will be funded as continuing resolutions. So as we sit here today um, preparing our FY18 budget, we anticipate level funding, but there's no guarantee of what we will receive. And in future years, we're really anticipating no funding of the CDBG program. What that means for us is we'll lose programs such as our demolition and clearance, our affordable housing, our down payment assistance, our housing rehab program, and the funding that we provide to nonprofit organizations. Also not on this list is things like public facilities where we did, recently did the splash pad and the parks and improvements such as that, the homeless shelter, all would go away. We would also not be able to address any of the areas citywide, whether we, we just finished our downtown revitalization efforts and we were focusing on our new river as a new target area. We would not be able to pursue those at least with any expectation of federal support. And that's what I have to share. Let's go back uh, to a couple of slides, if you don't mind. Let's talk a second about the nonprofit funding. You know that in your general fund, we allocate $50,000 a year, but also you allocate in community development funding for nonprofits. Review that, please. Yes, we allocate about $30,000 a year, and it supports approximately five nonprofits. That would be the homeless shelter, um, the Women's Center, Salvation Army, OUTS, United Way, 
And this year we were able to fund a partnership for children to do a program, a pilot program that they're doing with the school system. So that, those are the major priority <clears throat> programs that we fund. And the reason why I point that out is that if the community development program ceases, that will be a decision that you all are going to have to face is will we continue to fund at the $50,000 level or will we pick up some of the $30,000 loss? Remember, CDBG money goes to five or six agencies that she just said. The $50,000 of city money goes to not all of them, but many of them get funding from the city and from CDBG. Correct. Now, there may be, uh, we can get you a list, and, and I will follow that up with a budget note. We will show you for this past year who received what for CDBG, and then who received what from the general fund as far as um, community program funding. Richard. Well, what's the recurring revenues from uh, <clears throat> property sales and so on? That's about 180000 a year on the, what we call program income, which right. is the um, loan repayments from loans that we've made over the previous years. So we'll have revenue coming in for the next 20 to 30 years from some of the loans that we pre we've right previously made. Right now it's about 180000 Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. yeah. The other thing, Mr. Bittner, that uh, we would point out on that mm -hmm. is over the years, community development has purchased several properties that they're not going to be able to build upon. We're currently studying the feasibility of selling those properties to stormwater. Uh, the stormwater, if you think of the area around Sturgeon City and Wardola, Loyola. Loyola, whatever those streets are. I live down there. I just ride those streets. I don't know the names of them. But uh, several of those areas, we have uh, lots that we're no longer going to be able to build, and they are at a low elevation. So one of the things we will be looking at to produce some income that will help offset the loss if it occurs is selling those to the stormwater fund. The reason why I say the stormwater fund is I don't think you're going to be able to sell them on the, on the public market. When you have lots that are at two feet elevation, I'm not so sure that you're going to be able to get a, a private person to buy them, but we're, we're looking at those things. The other, what I consider great news, is on the demolition and clearance. So give us a quick update on that. The good news is that we've reached our 100 demolition over the last five years. <laughs> we, have, um, <laughs> we have torn down a lot of dilapidated structures in the city, and we're real proud of that. And we'll be celebrating that actually next week. You'll receive an invitation to help us celebrate National City Week on April the 19th, 10 o'clock a.m. We'll meet at 121 Poplar Street, which will... We will tear down actually two structures that make up the total 100, and then we will walk around the corner and celebrate two new home owners that have re recently had their homes constructed on Newberry Street. And so that will pretty much wrap up our downtown housing initiative, and we're really proud of all that's been accomplished there. Absolutely. Richard, on a positive note, the CDBG funding has been on, uh, one of the top priorities for NLC and for, for the league. Uh, there's a lot of effort that's been going on to communicate the importance of CDBG to uh, to the uh, the higher ups, and we were told by uh, Richard uh, Burr that um, that he didn't see any likelihood of changing or diminishing. Obviously, that's one person's yeah. communication, but there's been a pretty strong effort uh, to try to retain that funding and the importance of it. So. Hopefully something good will come out of that. Well, you know, we, we, always, we always look forward, but we also need to always look backwards. If you think of the benefit that this city council has brought to this community in the last five to six years, with all the new houses that you've built, with all of the homes that we have torn down, I will tell you, I do not believe any city in the state of North Carolina, maybe no city other than Detroit, has torn down more vacant and dilapidated houses than you have. You should be proud of that. A mm -hmm. hundred houses mm -hmm. in a six-year period. That is an amazing thing. You can still ride around Jacksonville and see some blight, but it's not like it used to be. Yeah. You, you used to be able to drive many, many streets. You cannot do that anymore, and you should take pride. If this program 
uh, should by some stroke be eliminated. You should not shed a tear because you have accomplished a tremendous amount given the money that you had and the efforts that street department and Lily's department, the fire department, code enforcement, what y'all have accomplished through that department has been nothing short of a major win. Any other comments? Thank you. Lily. Okay. Thank you. Well done. Lily. <clears throat> the other focus topic that we'd like to spend a few minutes on is the temporary agency and how the city uses them for part-time employees. Last year, when we were going through the budget, we told you this would be one of the items that we would study. And it has been an effort by the departments that use temporary employees, an effort by finance, and certainly an effort by human resources. There are two agencies that we use, Prototype and Blue Arbor. Now, don't confuse Blue Arbor with the people who also <laughs> produce the Blue Frog. That's it. Okay. Here is how much money we spend a year on temporary employees. 763,000 and their rounded numbers. Parks, 252, recreation 472, stormwater 11,000, streets 20,000, others 8,000. So you're basically spending 3 quarters of a million dollars. What do you get in return for that? You get day labor, seasonal work, special events, before and after school programs, supplemental city FTEs, full-time equivalents, and supplements to the part-time equivalents. And we'll discuss what that means. We also pay a fee every time that we ask Prototype or Blue Arbor to provide an employee. They obviously don't do this free. For every dollar that we pay for the temporary agency, 35% of it stays with Prototype and 32% stays with Blue Arbor. So when we hire an employee at $10 an hour, that employee doesn't actually get $10 an hour. We pay the $10 an hour, but the agencies keep it. And why? Well, the reason why is they have responsibilities. They have expenses. First of all, they're responsible for recruiting and screening. They do background checks. They have to pay FICA, just like we do. They also have to pay unemployment, just like we do. And they have to process payroll, just like we do. So don't in any way think that this presentation is saying that they're not earning their money. We just want you to see that when we hire a person at $10 or $15 an hour, 32 or 35% of that stays with the agency for these reasons. In the parks area, we hire 20 seasonal employees. They basically are for mowing, litter pickup, general maintenance. They started about two weeks ago and they'll run all the way through September. Now, we traditionally get half of them from Prototype and half from Blue Arbor. And Michael has kept very, very good records to show us how long do people stay with us. Of the 10 that we hire from Prototype, they actually went through 39 people between April 1 and the end of the mowing season. 24 worked less than five weeks. And not surprisingly, there were three or four that worked two days and said, this is not for me. <laughs> this is work. You know, you're out here with a weed eater, you're in the middle of the summer, it's 105 degrees, this is work. So some of them simply said, adios, I'm gone. Twelve of them worked about ten weeks, anywhere from a little over eight weeks to a little under 12 weeks. There were 12 of them that worked. Three of them worked the full season. And when they ended the season, the first thing Michael told those three was, if you're still looking for a job in April, you make sure that you come back. They were very, very good workers. Blue Arbor, for their 10, they process 20 persons. 
nine worked less than five weeks, nine worked about 10 weeks, and two worked the full season. So again, about five of the people worked the full season. Yeah. Several of these people have gone to work delivering pizzas around town. But we want, we Those want to numbers look normal to me. I'm not sure what you're looking at. What's the surprise? Right? What's the issue? <laughs> when it comes to parks and temporary agencies, here's our recommendations. Continue the use. We, some, we see no reason to change. We are trying to negotiate a lower rate for longer term employees. Now, what does that mean? Let me go back a slide. When a person is first hired, you know, Michael calls up and he says, I need 10 people. All 10 of those people, you have to go through the background checks, all the screening, all of that stuff. You got them lined up for payroll. You do drug testing. When that person has stayed with you, though, you don't have that continuing expense. So if a person's been with us, nine workers stayed 10 weeks, at least from my way of thinking, maybe not from the two agencies' way of thinking, we should see a decrease in the percent that they're keeping because they're not having to do drug screens every week. They're not having to do the background checks. They're still having to pay FICA. They're still certainly having to make payroll. But what we hope we can do is have a schedule that basically says, for the first so many weeks, we're going to pay 35%. For the next so many weeks, we're going to pay 30%. For the next so many weeks, we're going to pay 25% or some number. I will tell you, without mentioning the company's name, we've had one meeting that was not successful. They basically said, we appreciate the city's business, but we're not interested. Well, we're going to continue to negotiate and see if we can create some interest. But I think you understand the concept will be that we have no problem paying those rates when the person's only there a week or two weeks or three weeks. But when a person is with us for 10 weeks or longer, we feel like there should be some adjustments, so almost like buying wholesale versus buying retail or buying in bulk versus buying in single loads. So that's the recommendation in parks. Continue the temp agencies. Try to negotiate lower rates. This was the simple part. Okay. <laughs> Susan's part is recreation. Generally, depending on the time of the year, and Susan, feel free to come on up here. Uh, generally, in the time of the year, she will employ between 35 and 50 employees. She uses only ProType. More than 300 persons were needed to fill these assignments during the year. Now, that sounds like a lot, but let's look at how we use them. In recreation, we use them in before and after school programs. That's actually a very good job. It's dependable. The people are there. I mean, the job is there. It's inside. It's outside. But, you know, it's before and after school. We also have school out programs. What is that? Well, you have a teacher planning day. We provide for the children. They have a snow day. City Hall, even though City Hall may be closed, Recreation Department is probably open because they're providing a place so that when parents still have to go to work, they need a place for their child. Youth and senior programs, we use them there. Drivers, when we have uh, an event that we're going to take uh, youth this summer to a swimming pool, we'll hire a driver from them to drive or when the seniors are going on one of their many outings, we hire a driver through them to, to drive. Scorekeepers and concessions. So you can see while some of these are what I will call longer term jobs, a scorekeeper or a concession person, you know, as long as you went to NC State and you can count to nine innings in a five inning baseball game, you can be a scorekeeper, okay? You do have to be able to count up to 20 without taking your shoes off, though. Okay, we're good. When you look at the recreation, they really fall into two categories. The short-term, one-day or special event. That's a scorekeeper. That's a concession person. That's someone where we're having 
the, the national night out or you're having a winter fest and we need workers just for that one day. The second group are the long-termers. Those are the ongoing programs, especially the programs of before and after school. In category one, the short term, what are the issues? Turnover and training, but really not that big of an issue. If you have a different scorekeeper tomorrow night than you had tonight, not really a big deal. Training, yes, you have to make sure the person knows how to keep the score, how, you know, how to do the concessions. So when it comes to the short-term employees, really we're, we're not suggesting any changes there. When it comes to the long-term employees, the issues are turnover, lack of consistency, lack of professionalism, loyalty to city programs, and the basic cause is pay rate and lack of security. Now remember, these are the people who are primarily in your before and after school programs. These are the people who, you know, when Susan opens up a, you'll have how many before school programs this year? I'll have uh, at least three. How many after school programs? Eight. Eight. Uh, when she has someone who is a temporary employee and they're only making $10 an hour and 35% of that is staying, that means that our after school program is being operated by people who are basically earning before tax $6.50. You're not going to have long term people there. You're going to have turnover, and when you have turnover, you know, once again, lack of consistency, lack of professionalism. Now, this is a program where you as a council have established a policy that says this program is to be self-funded. The general tax dollar does not go in to support the before and after school program. It does for building the facilities, but for the operating costs, y'all have set the fees where they must cover the expenses. In this area, the recommendation is to continue with the temp agency for all of the Category 1 short-term uses. Recommendation 2 is to use the city HR to hire some of the Category 2 employees and to continue with temp agencies for the others. In this case, HR would be the ones who would be going out to hire for the before and after school program. The other recommendation, which I forgot to put on there, is that we also negotiate, just like we talked about with parks, negotiate a fee <coughs> schedule that scales down. The HR hires that are necessary in the before and after school programs, the assistant center supervisors, the before and after school staff, it's about $69,000. I'm not recommending that comes out of the general fund. I'm recommending that you increase the fee from $65 a month to $75,000. I'm sorry, not $75,000. <laughs> from $65 a month to $75 a month. Now, yes, that's $120 a year. But I'll also remind you that the information we provided two or three budgets ago when you all set that policy you're not anywhere close to the market. The market in a private nursery is well over $200 a month, and in some cases over $300 a month. So one of the recommendations that I would ask you not to vote on tonight but give consideration on is that we move these people. Ms. Washington hit it on the head a while ago. These are people who have been temp employees, and they are here literally all year long we move them into HR hires at a cost of roughly 69000 but you cover that cost not with property tax. This is a user fee. You use it, you're now going to pay $75, not $65. The thing we would do with that money is increase their pay and increase their hours. We think that will address the issues of turnover and consistency and lack of professionalism. What's the results? Effectiveness, efficiency, economy. 
reduces turnover, increases professionalism, it increases productivity because people know they're going to be there, and it becomes a self-funded program. That's the economy part of it. When you move on to stormwater, we hire four summer employees. The records show zero turnover, zero turnover from May through August. Those people work with us on water quality. They handle some classes with kids, and they do a lot of cleanup. Recommendation here is that we move away from the temp agencies completely because there is no turnover. Hire them once through HR, use some of that 35% or 32% you were paying the temp agency, transfer that to cover the cost of the additional employee in HR, also increase the pay a little bit more for the employee if you want to, but there is no cost on this one. This is a break-even cost in that money will move from the temp account into the part-time non-benefited account. HR will pick up some of the money to cover their employee we talked about earlier. And then the same thing really in the streets department. They hire four people primarily for mosquito control. March to May through June, depending on the mosquito season. They go out and do the larva siding. Almost no turnover occurs according to Johnny and again, the recommendation here is that these people be hired through HR and that the money that was going to the temp agency <coughs> comes to the city. Miscellaneous, we might as well keep this with the temp agencies because you just never know when a person is going to go out for FMLA. You know, you need somebody is, is unexpectedly sick and you got to have somebody in to cover a phone or something like that. This is an account that, you know, although it's 8,000 budgeted, you never know whether you're going to use 2,000 of it or 8,000 of it. It's just a catch-all account. Bottom line was this. You have $763,000 in the current proposed budget. It's not an increase from the current budget. What we're recommending is about 600,000 of that stay with the temp agencies. About 163 moves over and is managed by the city. And the only difference is you're picking up the potential liability on workman's comp. That's true. That's it, though. Yeah. You're, you are picking up the worker's comp matter, and that's a very valid point. And, of course, you know, uh, at the end of the day, uh, we can stay exactly where we are. This is not something that – this good. doesn't balance your budget one way or the other. <coughs> this is simply – one of the three E studies that you ask us to, or you authorized us to do, to say, do it this way or do it that way. And we're not asking you to make a decision tonight. We're giving this to you for information, uh, but we certainly welcome any questions or thoughts that you have tonight or in the next several meetings. HR can pick up the additional work without any increase in air personnel? No, sir. The, if you remember when we went through HR, we were recommending hiring a one additional person in HR. That's based on this? It's based upon this and better recruiting for police and fire. Roughly a third of the HR person, and a, a person in that level, when you pay salaries and benefits, you're talking about $50,000 a year. Now, certainly the salary isn't fifty. dollars salary is going to be in the 35000 range, but when you put in health insurance and the fact that they get into the North Carolina retirement system and all those other things, one employee costs you $50,000. Roughly 15 of that salary will come from the transfer that you were paying for the Blue Arbor or Prototype. Another 15000 is coming from budget reductions that Kimberly has agreed to in her own budget. So that employee will actually cost the city about fifteen to eighteen thousand dollars more, but again, that's additional money plus fifteen thousand worth of cuts out of her current budget, and roughly fifteen thousand out of the uh, transfer from Tim's. So, would the employees be temporary part-time or they would permanent be non, part-time? No, they I mean, would be non-benefited part-time employees. But I'm, the temp agent agency idea makes me think that's a a different person next year than it was last year and so on 
Is this going to be you're going to hire one person and they're going to stay till they decide to leave? Is that Ideally, the concept? That's a concept. That would be an ideal world. Right now, the turnover is a challenge. So if we can get one person to keep them um, for the duration, that would be ideal. How does the before and after school equate to the summer? Same staff. Do they do the same? I, we get we have to hire more because um, we don't keep all of the same thing but a lot of the staff are pretty much they'll roll over from the after school into the summer but additionally we'll still have to hire more to cover the the uh, the summer programs We're we are always uh, uh, we always have to maintain our ratios mm -hmm. so it's all driven by the number of kids and, and uh, um, demand but I'll also answer that this way uh, the mosquito <coughs> workers won't be back next year I mean they're and likewise, the people that Pat uses, they probably won't be back next year. So it's not, you know, it, you're Jim keeping... Wheeler will. I'm sorry? <laughs> Jim Wheeler will. Yeah, well, Jim, yeah, Jim Wheeler will. He'll always be with us. Yeah. yeah. And interestingly enough, uh, we, let's talk about that a second. We hired Jim uh, through the temp agencies for the following reasons. You can't, because of the Fair Labor Standard, and Kimberly, you probably have to come up here and help on this, we were, we were paying for him to do several different jobs for the city, and we were paying him different rates for the job. Well, he can't do that. You know, when that was brought to our attention, we said, whoa, 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 the only way that we can do this is through a temp agency. So you can hire a person through a temp agency to do job A at $15 an hour, and if he wants to come back to do a different job through the temp agency at $10 an hour, that's fine because they're not city employees. But what we were doing with that particular person was we had him hired in city departments, plus we were hiring him through the temp agency. And we said, well, you, can't, you can't have mix, you know, mix of marbles here. <laughs> you either have to be all city employee or all temp agency. So he is doing a great job for us with stormwater and with bus driving and other things. Yeah. So. yeah. After school, so you were talking about hiring those you know, to reduce turnover. Um, they would be full-time benefited employees? Yeah, they would be. the. If you remember, about two months ago, we sent you all under the 14-day rule a change to the number of hours that a person could be a non-benefited part-time employee. The federal law says that if you work 32 hours a week, then you have to be benefit. We were at we were at 50 hours every two weeks because that's what a payroll is for us. So we've changed it now to 60 hours every two weeks, and you remain non-benefited. Hopefully, that will reduce the turnover, which really puts a burden on you as far as tra retraining and to retrain all the time you and yes, your folks. How much, how much of your time was spent on retraining? Do you, do you mean, any, oh, any, what constant? Any well, wait a second. None of her time. It was her staff. She <laughs> delegated all this stuff to, you know. It's constant, to be honest with you. We'll get a new batch of employees in every couple of weeks, to be honest with you, and then you pretty much do a training. We, uh, we conduct multiple trainings every month and then a large uh, several day trainings prior to each program, being summer day camp and the after school program. So we spend quite a bit of our time in training because we have a lot of part-time people that they're, they're here and then they'll be here for a few months and then they're off, off to better things. When we get to the decision packages, you will find that uh, Susan was also asking for 16 additional people to be put into the program and I'm not recommending that. I think we have to, we have to recognize the financial consequences uh, and she does I'm not saying she doesn't but you will see in your decision packages that there were 16 other employees that she wanted to also move into the city and at this point uh, I think we just need to take it slowly Thank you. anybody got anything else questions thank you Susan. let me ask a question we we did a different budget we did a, di a different budget presentation tonight than we've done in the years past. We need to know, is that working for you? 
if it's not, it's easy for us to go back next week and the following week to the old format. I mean, I, I, we are here at your pleasure. And so whatever budget presentation or process works for you, that's what we're going to do. So if you are comfortable mm -hmm. with what we did tonight, that's what we're going to continue. But if you want more in-depth and so forth, all you have to do is say uh, there's so. There's going to be an opportunity for any council member to have that's a specific right. question about any particular thing. You know, they'll be able to ask that. But to me, I think it flowed very well tonight. Yes, it did. I have a question. There were, there were a few Clemson jokes and a few city jokes. <laughs> and and, a, and some pizza delivery jokes. over yeah. previous years. <laughs> the jokes before, weren't any better, though, were they? No. No, I didn't think so. Just less in quantity. <laughs> Richard, one quick question before we close. Getting back to mowing and all that. The, taking on the new Memorial Grove and all that, we were able to do all that without any increase? Well, actually, remember, no increase in this year, but if you remember a year the, ago... So we adopted that last year yes. to offset that. <coughs> That's correct. Okay. Right. And reimbursements from DOT hasn't increased at all. Well, it, it has increased, but you have to remember the reimbursements from DOT uh, come in the form of... Uh, I know we're on the air, so I'll say it politely. Very little money. Okay. Thank you. That's all. Without anybody saying anything further, I, I believe it. Though, if they have, you know, if a council member has a specific question about anything that rises in the budget, you know, by all means, ask. I mean, you. Sure. We're all pretty shy folks. I don't think. That's but every, everything. Like I, said, Randy. <laughs> I, I hope everybody agrees with me. It was kind of smooth the, doc, the, yes. the way it run. Yeah. So. You know, one thing I've been curious about, which you've mentioned a couple of times, that maybe you could have a brief, you know, run over, is the IT allocation. Because that's a lot of money that's allocated different ways, and you see the budget from year to year, and all of a sudden we get a bunch more and somebody else has a bunch less. But I know you've been obviously scrutinizing it, but it'd be interesting to hear. Yeah. Well, actually, I haven't been scrutinizing it. That's Ron's job. Okay. My job is fending <laughs> off the departments who wanted to lynch uh, Chris, <laughs> I mean, when the when the whole police department shows up with weapons drawn, I mean, I mean, it's like, come on, guys. The media, I'd have thrown them under the bus at that point. <laughs> I tried. Yeah. Uh, the the number of pieces of equipment that you have is not necessarily directly proportionate to the amount of time you need for your equipment. So, for example. If I have a phone and I have an iPad and I have a computer, those count as three pieces of, of equipment. On the other hand, if I have a in-car computer and it takes an awful lot of work because of all of the programs that I'm running on it, the amount of time that ITS allocates is different. So what Chris and, and Ron and others did was to try to look at utilization in a way similar to what Ed does with fleet maintenance. You know, they looked at utilization. And from that, they said, okay, if you're using this equipment, we're going to charge you this. If you're using this equipment, we're going to charge you a different rate. I will say to you, this is, uh, this is art not science. You will see that over the next year the allocations will continue to be tweaked as we try to get more accurate. I commend Chris and Ron and others, although I'm sure some of the departments don't commend them, <laughs> I commend them for trying to to be more accurate in who should be paying for what. At the end of the day, think of it this way, you know, one boat went up, one boat went down, but the amount of water in the bathtub stayed the same. I mean, the, the amount of money that was being charged is the same. Now, unfortunately, if the amount of, of money needed from water and sewer went down and the amount of money needed in general fund went up, it's not equal. you know, it's, it's not, not it, it comes out of different pockets. Right. But that's what we've tried to do. I will also say that since the initial uh, allocations went out. There have been two additional revisions to that to try to refine it. They have listened, I think, correctly to the staff, 
who have said, this really doesn't seem fair to me. So they have continued to revise that. Now, Chris, why don't you come up a second? This is something you worked on. And if you and Ron would like to add anything else, otherwise I'll try to protect you from the police officers in the room. Ron, you and Chris want to add well, the, anything? The to process we had was relatively simple. It was total instruments, you know, by department. And again, Richard pointed out the fact that, you know, the instruments included your desk phone, which doesn't take a lot of programming, you know, and that. Plus, yeah, IT also, you know, sets up the mobile phone accounts and, and things like that. So there's time of the staff, you know, getting, getting those things set up. But again, the waiting may not be exactly where it ultimately needs to be. But again, Chris, uh, Richard used a good example of the mobile terminals in a police car because you've got connectivity, you've got the, the locating device, and you've got many electronic devices in that vehicle that IT has to basically get them all in sync compared to, you know, what you have with your, your uh, iPad and that kind of thing. So that's where we're moved. And that and we'll, we'll show you when we go over some of the IT uh, initiatives under Triple E. We'll show you a, a list of some of the equipment, you know, to get an idea of the different categories in that. Besides but, equipment, are some of the work assigned on a base of job orders? We we, can, we do, but we don't. We didn't charge for that, just proactively because we don't want to <clears throat> users feel that every time they ask IT a question, there's going to be a bill associated with that. So we look at the equipment as a tool. So the more tools you have, the more expensive it is to support those tools. Now, there are different tools. For example, PC has an operating system, has a software that's local to the PC, and then there's this Citrix virtual desktop that we support in them back. So you literally have two. So we not only quantify every single tool, but we also put a weight to it. So it's easier for us to support your smartphone versus to support the PC. We cannot charge for those two devices identical amounts, so we put a weight. And we try to be as um, objective as possible, but like Dr. Woodruff said, some departments brought us back to earth and said, hey, it doesn't work that way. So I don't remember any gun, guns being pointed at me, but uh, Chief called me a few times over the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> and the radar was set up outside your closet. I know those tricks. I'm not speeding in Jackson. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For your session next week, what we'd like to do, we will not go through any department budgets, but what we would like to do is focus on some of the topics uh, proposed for next week will be, uh, as Chris talked about, the ITS, what you're going to hear there are... Uh, significant savings that we've had with computers and copiers and printers and phones. Uh, Wally's going to give you an overview of the mobile 311 or 311 work order system to show you how that is, is moving us to be more efficient. You'll hear an update on the 800 megahertz project and then we'll talk to you about the three-year equipment replacement program that we initiated last year. Move we adjourn? Aye. Aye. Aye.